Finally, before we get started, I do have one very, very special introduction tonight. I'd like to recognize on behalf of George, Acrovo Emanuelides, who is here in the front row. Acrovo Emanuelides was hired as a secretary at the age of 16 to work for Herman Goldstein when he was working with Eckert and Mockley at the Moore School on the ENIAC project. And when Herman Goldstein moved from the ENIAC project to IAS to work directly with John von Neumann and that incredible team there, Acrovo went with him and had a very distinguished career doing far, far more than simply being uh, a secretary to Herman Goldstein. She was there at the creation and she's traveled from Palos Verdes tonight to be here for this program. Acrovo, would you please stand up? You're so tiny, Acrovo. I saw people in the back sort of craning to see you, but we're delighted you're here, and we may even take a few questions for Acrovo tonight during the Q&A session. So if you'd like to ask some questions of someone who worked directly with the legends, please feel free to pass those up. And now tonight's program. The world inhabited at Princeton University by Alan Turing and John von Neumann more than seven decades ago seems distant and inaccessible in many ways. And yet George Dyson's brilliant new book, Turing's Cathedral, The Origins of the Digital Universe, makes it as vivid and relevant as today. Indeed, it could hardly be more relevant. The world we inhabit, the cathedral, described by Alan Turing, is governed, powered, and driven by mere variations on the early code and the machines that they envisioned and built. It would be simplistic to say that in von Neumann's case, the stories are important, because as Dyson writes, the digital universe and the hydrogen bomb were brought into existence by the same team, von Neumann's team at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Turing's Cathedral deals with those stories in detail. What is far more profound, however, and what we will also deal with tonight, is the legacy and the implications of those fateful days, as if the hydrogen bomb itself is not fateful enough. And at the center of it, the man, John von Neumann, mathematician, teacher, inventor, towering intellect. The physicist Edward Teller described von Neumann in this way, if a mentally superhuman race ever develops, its members will resemble Johnny von Neumann. This is not George Dyson's first attempt to help us understand at both a technical and a human level the way we coexist and co-create with computing. He is the author of Darwin Among the Machines as well, uh, two other books also, and he writes and speaks frequently on this subject. And this is not totally his day job, because as you may know, he is, in addition to being a science historian and author, a boat builder and designer from his home in Bellingham, Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming George Dyson. Thank you very much. Great. 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 Welcome. Thank you. So glad to have you here, George. It's great to be here. It's a fantastic exhibit. They're just incomprehensibly good. You've well, thank you. Great thank job. you very much. And we're delighted you're here and you're among friends. These are your people, George. So <laughs> thank you. We're going, we're going to have some fun tonight. Well, let's talk about first the, the process of writing the book. Now, you have an intensely personal connection to Princeton and the advanced. Uh, the, advanced, uh, the Institute of Advanced Study because of your father, Freeman Dyson. So and, and my mother. Bit. And your mother. My mother was there first. So. Absolutely. So talk a little bit about that. What it was like to grow up and be among people at IAS. Well, the, you have to be careful what I say, but it, it, for a child, you know, for, for a young boy, it was not that interesting a I mean, place because the, it was populated mainly by theoreticians who were, you know, would work on pencil and paper all day and go off in the woods and talk about physics. And maybe the most exciting thing really were the chalkboards. They, they still used chalkboards at that time. There was no PowerPoint. And the, but there was this outbuilding off in the, in the back where Julian Bigelow was building this machine. And that, that's what interested me. So I spent, I spent a lot of my time poking around and taking things apart that were discarded as scrap from the project. So that was... There's a famous story about um, your babysitter being Einstein's secretary. Yeah, I mean, pe people behind every great 
man, there is somebody who keeps track of things, and that was Helen Dukas, who, who was a fantastically intelligent woman, who really was, she was sort of, she was Einstein's search engine, who, who, who could, when Einstein needed something, it was Helen who knew where everything was. And, and she, but she didn't have her own children. She grew up in a family, I can't remember, it was 11 children, I mean, a huge number of children in her family. And she missed that, so she sort of adopted our family. I had four younger sisters. She really was their babysitter, and my job was to sort of make her life difficult while she, while she was trying to babysit my sisters. And, but I owe her a tremendous lot because she, I was really being difficult one day, and she said, why don't you stop, you know, settle down and read a book. And I said, there's no books, I've read all the books. There's no, and she went to the shelf and pulled down a book and gave it to me and said, read this. And it was Contiki by Tor Heyerdahl. And that was the first adult book that I read. And, and I, you know, that changed my life. That really did change your life. Yeah, and she, she had the perception to see that. I don't think that was an accident. I think mm -hmm. she said, I'm going to give this kid this book. So hanging out with this crowd uh, as a kid, did it become a natural thing for you to be curious about who they were and about von Neumann in particular and the meaning of computing? Yeah, that came later really thanks to Esther, my sister, who, who had such an influence on, on the community here. Um, thanks to Esther, I started going to her technology conferences in the, in the early 80s. And I saw this whole world, you know, the, the world of personal computer was, was flourishing. And then I realized I knew that that came from this barn, you know, this outbuilding behind where I had grown up. And, and so I, and I wanted to understand that. So that's when I became interested in, in sort of going back and finding out what really happened. And I, and I have to say outright that I'm, I'm less interested in, in who was, I'm not trying to find out who was first, I'm trying to find out what really happened. But right, so in fact, you specifically say this is not a book about first. It's not the first computer, it's not the first electronic computer, it's not the first high-speed electronic computer, it's, it's not the first stored program computer. You can almost say maybe it's the first computer with a fully random access memory, but even then there was a couple that were first. So it's the first of nothing, but it's, it, it was the ancestor in the sense that it was the one that got copied. Just like, you know, the Newton was the first iPhone, but uh, didn't become the iPhone. We've learned the hard way that between the word first and the word computer, there are about 19 adjectives, depending yes. on uh, exactly. how you want to deal so with it. So just stop, don't say first and don't say invent, <clears throat> and you're, you're safe. You told me a fascinating story about the treasure trove of papers that you were allowed to get access to some that hadn't seen the light of day since the mid-1940s. Can you talk about that? Yeah, there were a number. I mean, that's the reason the book exists was people kind enough to let me into their garages, their basements, in the case of the Institute, sort of their uh, own archives. The Institute for Advanced Study had been very protective of their, essentially their privacy, their, their private organization. And thanks to Charles Shimoni, who's, who's one of your benefactors, it was really Charles who pushed the door open, said, let George in to have access to this stuff. And, and I found unbelievably amazing things. I mean, it was just, uh, it, 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 you know, for someone like me, it was just unbelievable to go there. Uh, my daughter, who's here, came with me, and we, you know, we, we had, had a year, I, th I think she knows, I, I, every day I would poke around these documents all day and then, then come home and go back in the morning. It was just, because I normally work in archives where, you know, I've got 48 hours and I'm sleeping on somebody's couch and have to beg a photocopier and, you know, it was amazing to have that access. You, you write about an amazing piece of paper you found, which looks like it was torn from a, a notepad and crumpled up and thrown away, but then somehow retrieved and uncrumpled. Yes, saved. What, talk about that. And this wasn't in the Institute archives. This was in the papers that Julian Bigelow, who was the engineer, who, like most engineers, saved things. So he saved a lot of papers. And when he died, his family allowed me to sort of to go through his papers. And in there was a scrap of lined paper that on the, on the top said, let a word be 40 BD. So that puts it before the event before, before the word bit. bit, so that's like 1946. Uh, be 40 binary digits, 
and a command and an address. I mean, 10, 10 bits for the command and 10 bits for the 